Anyway, listen, it's fully prime, everyone. Um, we've got a guest today. We're very excited. It's, it's some week of football. It's some summer of football, really. Uh, we have some people away on, on little vacays. Uh, for example, Wonga isn't here today. Jimmy's not here. But JC's back from, from a vacay. Uh, Dubs is here and Craig's here. And I'm obviously here because I'm talking. And our guest today is a veteran of, what, 40-odd caps, 42 caps, I think, for Canada, according to your Wikipedia. 40. Yeah, 42. I wasn't counting, though. No. Was it 42? Okay, 42. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, David Egger, currently on the staff, of course, at Forge, who have a huge game this Wednesday against TFC, where Forge might be favorites. I don't know. I haven't looked at the odds. Um, MLS, CPO, it probably will be TFC, but the way they're playing right now, I, I don't know. But we'll get to that later. Um, we were just talking, though, off, off camera here. Um, is this the greatest summer of, of football we've ever had in Canada here. And it's got to be up there, right? Let's start with you, David. Eddie. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, Eddie. I was going to type that in, the, in my name <laughs> bar here. But uh, yeah, I think, like we said off camera there, it's it's been the best in my lifetime, I think. And what makes you think is nobody's itching for the Premier League to get back. Nobody's talking about when does the season start? When does La Liga start again? It's what's what game's on next. And it's almost overwhelming with the amount of games. It's been absolutely brilliant. Brilliant. And it's like not even close to being finished just yet. We've got the Olympics in a few weeks' time as well. When when the women's team dubs. I had to mention that and I was gonna mention it dubs. I know you you insisted, but it's true, right? This, this summer of soccer. <laughs> you should just be mentioning Sunday. it, which you did. So well played, <laughs> fair play to you. Yeah. But See? I was gonna jump right into that to say we haven't even gotten to the 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 promise of the Olympics for the women to, to podium a fourth time in a row. So that's gonna be added to all of the the delightful football that's been on and the spectacle that we've witnessed up to this point. I suppose it, it helps an awful lot when we've got uh, our men's team in the semifinal of Copa America as well. And in, in a tournament that has been a lot more exciting to watch, in my opinion, than Euros. Euros has been a little bit on the dull side, I have to say. Yeah, Eddie, your thoughts on that? Because I, I agree, this is not a great Euros, but Copa, despite the, you know, it's, it's also a frustrating experience, right, to watch south american style of football is great on one hand i love the passion the the technical ability is amazing but the refereeing the the shit housery the dark arts if you're not used to watching that brand of football you can understand why people might be getting frustrated in its magnificence as well yeah i'm glad i'm i'm glad everyone's able to see it and like you talk about the dark arts and the refereeing and stuff because this is something craig you you saw you had to deal with as a player playing for the national team um but yeah, it's been exciting. And I, I read something yesterday about the pitches being smaller in Copa America too. I think that's probably making it a little bit more exciting. All the pitches are the same size and, and much smaller. So yeah, it's uh, it has been a bit dull. I think I'd agree with, with Stacks there in terms of the Euros. It hasn't been the most exciting. And, and I've leaned towards watching the Copa America. It's just been pretty exciting. And obviously with the national team involved, it's an uh, extra bit of spice for us. Did anyone here have Canada in the semifinals? Dubs, did you have them in the semifinals? What was your pre? <laughs> no, no, definitely not. No, I don't know if I had predictions. And I'm always, I'm a hometown gal, and I always root for Canada. I'm always going for Canada. Um, but you have to be realistic as well. I think they've absolutely outperformed expectations, and long may it continue. But I think just I wanted to add to the Euros. I think that the reason we see it as dull, yes, there have been those matches that are underwhelming, listless, lackluster, but it's been the big guns, I think the heavyweights that have shown up and played that type of football, which is, I think, um, almost a paradox given the amount of talent in those rosters. So I think that's what's been um, a letdown is that maybe the expectations were were too high and you've but you've seen great football played by remember that Turkey A Georgia game. You know, you've seen mm -hmm. um sort of the minnows or or teams that maybe weren't slated as being the top performers play some really thrilling, compelling football. But I think when it comes to the the big guns, like your France's, like your England's, I think Spain has done outstanding um, and mm -hmm. played really good football. Um, Germany, to a lesser extent, even though after a really terrible 2023, I think that they probably did better than many thought, even though they were the hosts and expectations, maybe they are a little bit unfair on them. But Copa America has been great. And I think that seeing Canada go really far um, has been thrilling for us. And we were talking about last pod about um, changing the narrative 
the women have done it for a long time and now the men are doing it. And so worldwide, I think people are starting to set up and take notice of what Canada is doing. David, I was going to ask you, um, because of some of the substandards we've seen, some of the star players not playing at the level that we sometimes expect from them, the pressures of playing international football and the amount of football that these players are playing these days is extensive and there's no break. We know, as you know, going back to preseason, the first week of July, they're already well back into the preseason and they haven't finished last season yet. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a long season. I think you look at the England players and I don't go into many tournament charms with much hope, but uh, it's it has been. You can see it. They're exhausted. I think players, you can see the leagues that have taken breaks um, is probably – it's fit better for those types of players, those countries, but the English players are, they're exhausted and it, it has probably taken away sort of some of the, um, the athleticism in it and, and whatnot, but because it's a long old season, a lot of games. You know, here's the thing though. Here's what I'm doing. So up until now, I haven't enjoyed a moment of this tournament because of England struggles. <laughs> because so you're I, miserable. Because I'm, well, <laughs> there's <why>. that. <laughs> <laughs> that is part of it. But because of the style, you know, and the expectations that I put on this team, right? So we can criticize the players, but I, I decided in my head that with this team, they can win this tournament, right? And so far, they're disappointed yet get into the semifinals. So here's the reinvention of the narrative for the semifinals. And I put this in, on Twitter, and people agree with me. I'm now going to approach this game against the Dutch, um, looking at England as this plucky underdog, this team of no-hopers <laughs> who are having this fairy tale yeah. run at, the, at Euros. It's like, wow, I don't care how they get there. Just get there. I'm going to enjoy every lateral pass, every fucking backwards pass. <laughs> Every short corner that goes back to the goalkeeper, I'm going to embrace all this uh, shit. It's going to be great. That's how we enjoy it. All right? Can we agree? There you go. That's how there we enjoy it. It's not the players' faults that, that we decided they're going to be this incredible they're team. Special. They're special, the English fans, <laughs> yeah. aren't they? Uh, oh, yeah. We're special, all right. <laughs> but yeah, it is, though. It's fatigue, culture. right? It's fatigue, though. They are, I mean, this isn't just – it isn't – look at France. The same thing's happening with them right now. Mm -hmm. Of course, their best players got a smash nose, but – they the, the players are, are exhausted. Harry Kane's clearly got some kind of injury, a back injury, where you think he got late in the German season. People are now calling him is, is Harry Kane England's Ronaldo? Like, I saw call, that too. Uh, I, I love it though, right? Get the guy <laughs> off the field. Yeah, it's, it's a valid point, Dubs. Don't you think? I mean, given the way he, he's he's not playing up to his capabilities. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I, I think you look at um, how he fills the net consistently consistently wherever he is like devoid of, of silverware we know that that's a bit of a curse of of Harry Kane but like the the way that England's underwhelmed I think dependent on Harry Kane is highly unfair you know you, mm. you the, there's been critiques of, of Foden not enough space to operate but then you can say with Bellingham and Foden Kane doesn't have enough space to operate and like really do what he wants to do we've talked about this before like drop off a little bit more so I mean does Southgate need to have him on every single minute of every single match probably not but I mean, to, to throw him into the Ronaldo conversation <laughs> is, um, I don't think that's right. I mean, it's a good headline for sure. But I mean, Martinez in the way that he managed Ronaldo, I mean, he was like every single match making that team sheet was like dealing with the heaviness of Ronaldo's legacy for, for Portugal. Like just, they just couldn't get out of their own way because they had to manage that ego. Yeah, that's a valid point. You're, you're right. All right, listen, let's, enough about England, though. Let's get this Canada <laughs> stuff. Because if Canada is, you know, Canada's like the Georgia and the Turkey, right, of Copa, the smaller team with less expectations that have really done something and have brought joy to the tournament, unless, of course, you're an American and you're on the Fox panel, in which case you're really unhappy about it. But it makes it even more enjoyable for us. Um, what, what should the mindset be, Eddie, coming into this game against Argentina? You played them once already. You played well. You weren't embarrassed by any stretch. At the same time, Argentina know what to expect now as well. So, so mm -hmm. what do you think that mindset in the Canadian room is going to be entering this one against the world champions? Well, listen, I, I don't know what's being said, but I can only imagine it's tournament football. It's completely different. It's 90 minutes. It's 11 players against 11 players. Anything can happen. I know we're talking about some of the best players in the world and the best player in the world, but we've shown we can compete. We've shown anything can happen in those 90 minutes. And... I didn't get to see the last game, but by all accounts, they were phenomenal in the, in the I caught the, the second half after our game. But from what I'm hearing, we're attacking, we're, we're, we're getting after them, we're pressing. Um, so why not go and do it against the, 
the best team in the world in a one-off game. And I think, to, you know, Charms, this team is, well, Richie Larea said it, we're a different team than we were three weeks ago. And that's that's certainly true. And in that game, I think Buchanan was on the right, yeah, Liam Miller on the left. Both, uh, you know, I mean, unlucky for Buchanan, obviously, and we wish him well to get back. This change, and now Richie's out there. You got Orso in there. You got Schaffelberg, who's absolutely killing it. And if he plays at the same level as he did in the last few games, they, they'll cause some major problems for this Argentinian team. So I think we know that they're going to create chances and whether they can take them or not, because the rate that they've been taking chances hasn't been there. We have to be honest. They've created, I think, with 12 or 13 really good chances in this whole complete tournament. So there have been chances there to score, and they're going to have to take every single one of them because they're going to give up opportunities. Mm -hmm. Dubs, uh, how would you rate John David's tournament so far? He's had moments of like brilliance, flashes of brilliance, but he's also missed his, his fair, fair share of chances. Yeah, I think it's fair to criticize him given his own standards and what he does with Lil. Like he's widely recognized. I mean, frequently talked about the, as the best number nine in, in CONCACAF. And then you could even say worldwide, right? If you were a, a Canadian or you have that bias, I think it would be fair to say. So if anyone's going to take their chances, um, you want the ball in anybody's foot at the top of the box when he gets that that pass across from Schaffelberg when he's released into space by, by was Eustachio or, or Davies on the left, in that first half, you want it to be John David and he kind of scuffs it or doesn't really hit it with conviction. And that's unlike him. Um, I think that Kyle Laren, I had been uh, critical of him and uh, Marsh's decision to keep him in the 11. I think we maybe like move Oso up and then you move David to that nine. Uh, but I thought Laren did a lot of great work off the ball. Um, mm -hmm. He uh, won a lot of important balls on, on set pieces defensively. Um, and I, I think that he's getting in important areas, but, but going back to Canada needing to take their chances and just be a little bit more incisive in that final third, you're generating the chances. They look lively. They look dynamic. They look dangerous, but you have to start to bury some of these chances or it's going to come back and bite you. And I mean, they, so they, they, I think they see that game out. They, they look highly confident in penalties. I mean, Kone just was otherworldly, you know, like a kid like him to see him bury a chance like that. And so calm, so composed. Um, and I love that camera angle where it's from behind the players at halfway mm -hmm. and you see him finish it and he just walks slowly away with such swagger. Like, I just love that. And so that is going to give them like to David's point about it being in a tournament play, like that just gives you and Richie's comments, like we're a different team. And like, how can you really be a different team? It was just a few weeks ago that you fa faced Argentina, but the way that they've navigated it, the way that they've sort of ticked the boxes and the in, in the manner in which they've done it. I mean, you you that that's an intangible, I think that gives this team a lift and gives them an edge going in to face the world champs in, in Argentina. Um, so but they do they can make it easier for themselves if they continue or if they they'll make it difficult for themselves if they don't continue to take these chances and make it a lot easier for themselves if they finish the number of really dangerous chances that they're creating. You're Great muted for us. Oh. You know as well as anybody, David, you can have a really good uh, players on your side, but does that necessarily make a good team? And one thing this guy, these group of players are doing is they're, as a unit, they're they're performing incredibly well. And the manager, Jesse Marsh, I have to give him a ton of credit for what he's done because this team is defensively much better. I mean, obviously, Max Crapo has been standing on his head, but the defenders are really attacking the ball, and it's been uh, quite a desire from them. No, 100%. And, and you can see from the outside looking in, you can tell when a team is working for each other and when they're not. Uh, and when they're buying into what a, a coaching staff is doing and when they're not. And you touched on the defenders there. And obviously, Crepo speaks for himself. He's been fantastic. But there was talk before this about who's going to step into center back position, who's going to solidify those positions in the spine of the team. And I think we have our answers now after this tournament. Really, so far, moving forward, I think two players have really grabbed those those jerseys and it's theirs moving forward. So that's football for me. And, and it, it's, as, a, as an ex-center back, it's exciting to see that two fantastic players have come in. Derek's had a great season over in, in um, Sweden. And then Moisey's come in and done fantastic playing for the national team. He's composed, he's collected, and we can play out from the back. And first and foremost, they're defenders. And that's what you got to see in, in Copa America. And they love to defend. So for me personally, I've been 
uh, we talk about missing chances, but remember I got 42 caps, so I had plenty, plenty of opportunities to miss chances there for the national team. But uh, it, about the defending, it, it's it's making me super proud to see, and and I'm really happy to see it for the national team. And David, how about the the two of them? Sorry for us, just to go yeah. back to Bambito and uh, and Cornelius and the way that that partnership has continued to to blossom, and also just last game I was I was re-watching it because I also had missed the the first half and so I went back and I watched it and they were a couple of you know dodgy decisions um Bambito clearing it and hands it directly to to the Venezuelan player um loose in possession occasionally but then the way that they managed those ebbs and flows in game as as a central defender or as a center back how do you keep composed there how do you bring the mindset back so that you even despite a mistake um, you're able to bring that quality back up again so that you're you're there in defense, but that you're there for the buildup as well. Well, I think that what they've been fantastic at is just moving on. You make a mistake and move on and then yeah. making sure you, your next pass, your next header, your next tackle is completed. Right. And that's that's basically what you need to do, because I know none of us. I don't know if you guys have been to any of these games in the, in the tournament, but from what I, I can hear is absolute mayhem. It, you could probably hear you can't even hear yourself think and those aren't canadian fans by the way those are all against us so it's intimidating it's tough to play against so you do make mistakes and you have to regroup but that has to come internally because you're not hearing many voices out there within within the group so i think i've been impressed with that obviously it's 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 an intimidating atmosphere and you could either crumble or you uh you regroup from the mistake. So I was going to ask you, David, about Bombido as well as like, he's only, well, he's played less than, if you look at his club career and his international career, it's less than 50 games at, yeah. at, a, at a decent level. And he seems to be getting better and quickly. How good do you think he can get? I think he get very good. I've seen him from obviously this, each game get better. Each game from, I believe it was, I think the first game I saw him was the the Holland game and uh, the build up to it. Um, and he got better each game, each game. So I think he can, he can really, you can tell he's got that midfielder in him where he's good on the ball and he, and he's played there. Um, but he's got everything and all the attributes to be a top, top center back for years to come for the national team. So listen, the ball's in his court. If he keeps getting better, you can tell, you can tell the manager likes him and he's happy with what he's doing. So you can only continue to get better. Dubs, uh, it helps with having that guy on the right-hand side, right? Alistair Johnston, who I think has had a fantastic tournament so far. I mean, he's a guy that isn't intimidated. He, he's, you know, being at numerous old firm derbies, doesn't get more intimidated than that. He plays the way Jesse Marsh wants him to play. He's tough, he's tenacious, but he's also, I think that almost, we almost turn a blind eye to his technical ability. He's a good passer of the ball as well, a really good passer of the ball. And, and having that experienced head, he's not an old guy, but he's experienced uh, beside those two centre backs is, I think, not not spoken of enough so far. Yeah, and what I was um, noting, and I alluded to it just when the, my question to David about maybe seeing a little bit of inconsistency out of Cornelius and Bombito, but they were given a lift, I think, by the steady, consistent play by the guys that were on either side of them, in Davies and in um, Alistair Johnston, who had, I thought, outstanding performances, but but quiet. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean bad, but it's just maybe understated. But you see a guy like like Johnston, as you're talking about, there's a simplicity about his game that's refreshing. Um, he often makes the right decision um, and, and not a lot of flash, but there's not a lot that's going to throw him off his own game. Um, so I think what he lent to that team, not only as that steady presence, um, unbeatable 1v1. I mean, if he did make a mistake, like dove in and he was beaten on the inside, he took a professional foul. And if he's beaten to the outside, he often was was catching up those two steps. He got beaten and making the tackle and whether winning it again or putting it out for a corner. But then offensively, how like tuned in he is and switched on the way like his his throw-ins, I think, were key. And that, that leads to Schaffelberg's goal. Um, so he's just a highly involved player. And highly intelligent. I think his soccer IQ is also undervalued, um, but he, he put in quite a shift the other night against Venezuela. And Craig Dubs mentions Fonzie there, and Marsh spoke about it on the weekend, saying that given him that captain's armbands, given him that that place at status within the team, that he doesn't need to try to do too much. And in the past, we've seen I think Fonzie trying to do too much, put too much of the mm -hmm. pressure on his own shoulders, right, and make mistakes. Like Dubs said, he's been quiet by his standards, but. He's had a good tournament as as well. He's been a far more conventional fullback, it seems. 
Yeah, it's like taking the pressure off him to, to you know, instead of having to be the best offensive player, best defensive player, best midfield player, all these different things. Just look after your job and pick and choose your moments to go forward when those moments come. And I think he's done that brilliantly well because we know how good a player he is. And I think you're right. I think, and I think Jesse's right. You know, we, we talked about the captaincy and not really, you need all the players to be captains out there. Um, but from a standpoint of the hostilities, our players are prepared for it, not only because of international football, but at club level. You know, Bayern Munich and Alfonso Davies is hostile. Are you kidding me? Porto, Estacchio, Celtic against Rangers. Like he, these guys have, ex, you know, experienced it all. Lerner's in Spain, David in France. Like these guys have, are used to the hostile crowds and it doesn't seem to face them. Eddie, did you find that when you played for Canada, about, you know, it wasn't that many years ago, actually, but fewer players played, you know, in the hotbed of, of football. You know, obviously you're, you're at Newcastle, you're okay. at uh, Burnley, Birmingham. I mean, like you, you, you've experienced it, but your teammates hadn't. Did you notice that on, on the big, tough trips south, some of these players had difficulty with it? Yeah, I think, listen, we, we had, there was a spell there where we had players who were unattached playing in World Cup qualifiers, right? That's not, that's not the world we live in now. And that just shows how far we've come as, as a country and as a nation in the footballing world. So, yeah, there was times where it was intimidating. Like Honduras, the 8-1, you, you, I still hear those buzzales in my sleep sometimes, right? Like it's, <laughs> you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't hear yourself think and it, and it, and it, it sticks with you and, and you know it is a different type of atmosphere. But like you say, these players, like an old firm derby, there's not much more intimidating than you're going to play it in the Nat, right? right. Um, so it's, we're prepared for it now for sure, for sure. You played with the Ozo a number of times in Canada, right? You must have done. Your mm -hmm. last game was 2018, I think. Um, he's speaking yeah. of captains. Um, now, he, listen, he's TFC's captain. He's not a captain for for this team, but he's kind of forced his way onto that into that side at the expense of, of Ishmael Kane at this point, mm -hmm. who's won very much for the present and future. Wonderful talent. And I thought he looked really good, actually, off the bench in the last match. But what can you say about Ozo? And, and that it seems a calming influence, it seems, in that midfield in certain games. Yeah, I think so. And 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 like you say, he can put his foot on the ball in those frantic games when when it's transitioning. He can put his foot on it. He can find pockets of space where people don't know where to defend them, and he and he does that well and just kind of shows up. So Oso's Oso's fantastic. Man. In terms of of the armband, for me personally, it just shows it's what happens in big football nations that the top player, the superstar, gets the armband type thing. You know what I mean? And that and that's. We, Canada's there, and how crazy is that? Like to be able to say that that we can hand the armband to Alfonso Davies. Is he ready for it? Who knows? I don't think leadership. Nobody ever is a finished product as being a leader. It's a constant thing of growth, but it's only going to help him. Um, but we are now a nation who has a superstar as our captain. I think that's pretty uh, pretty exciting times for us, right? But refreshing yeah, too to hear Marsh. Sorry, Charms, just about no. the captaincy to to talk about Fonzie to say he's the guy for it. We want him to have the armband. He's the face of this team, this global superstar. But the from a leadership aspect, it's a work in progress. And I think that for Fonzie to be shepherded and guided by a guy like Marsh, who seems to be very clear-eyed and level-headed about the whole process, and then also for Davies to have the support in terms of leadership with the other personalities on the team, like an Oso, like a Eustachio. Um, I think he's in a good space where he can be lifted up when he needs to be and doesn't feel the need to put everything on his shoulders all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, the more we talk about this, for, from Fonzie as captain to, you know, the midfield to the defenders, I, I can't see a scenario where they don't beat Argentina now. <laughs> so, 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 so confident at the moment okay. it's, it's great hey craig but you know you, you look back craig when john herbins first took over canada right remember we talked about it it's as if everything he touches turns to gold and it seems right now with jesse marsh it's the same kind of thing everything he's mm -hmm. trying out there is working right we, we could criticize fonzie's armband they're in the semi-finals of copa right you, you can't criticize it the selections ozo coming in um you know miller being dropped to the bench this kid, Schaffelberg, coming in, everything he touches turns to gold. At yeah, point, and, who, and whoever's, on the, whoever's on the bench, these impact players, like whether it's Liam Miller coming back off, they're fine. Kone, fine, right? They've been absolutely brilliant in those roles, which is uh, not always easy because I think Tejon 
uh, for all his, his excellent attributes, uh, I think he needs to play regular football. And I think that's where he's missed out at Inter. He's been coming on as a substitute. And I think he needs to play 90 minutes on a regular basis to be at his best. And unfortunately for him, that didn't happen. And and now he's got a bit of a problem. And it's unfortunate for him, too, because I wanted to see him get a, a preseason with Inter, uh, which would have been great uh, leading into the season. Um, that might have helped him. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen for, for him. But uh, all the other players have been absolutely top class i can think of a marsh misstep though Ooh. well yeah. after corney scores the goal they win they're going to semi-finals historic moment for the for the men's program and he dances like this uh, <laughs> <laughs> regrettable decision but that's the only one he's made so far <laughs> i kind of like yeah. it <laughs> of course he did forrest <laughs> i got that move in my locker <laughs> yeah oh we know you do but going back to oso um about how you like engaged also and how engaged and like connected he is i think he's a guy who to me is just like steady hands all the time and like they had a a social media post where they were shooting hoops and there was one of oso from the three-point line is just swish swish yeah. swish so like that, that's was, the, like that was a college is. line by the way not the nba line just oh, you so know, you know Forrest, would you just leave it please <laughs> just let me tell the story about oso and how masterful he was from the three-point line thank you <laughs> Okay, so explain this to me, uh, Eddie. All right, so we're seeing the swagger with this team, which they had in qualifying for the World Cup. We kept talking about the swagger of the brotherhood, you know, this deep resolve they had. Um, and then it just disappeared for 18 months. It went away. We didn't see it. Like, And now it's back. Was it always there? What happened? What happened? This, this dark period for the men's team, this great momentum at the World Cup. The World Cup comes, not a great World Cup. And mm -hmm. then from there on in, it's just this, this disappointment. Do you know what happened there? Was it? I don't know. Because I, I can't make well, sense of it. It's, it's just life. It's football, right? Like nothing's ever, nothing's ever straightforward. Nothing. It's all up <laughs> and down. It's a roller coaster, right? It's, and it's polarity. Like when things are going good, there's going to be things that are going bad. And, it, and it's just how you handle when it comes, right? And look at look at us now. So we've we've handled it. We've dealt with it as a as a country, as an organization, we've got the manager in place in time for the tournament and we're in the semifinals. So all is well. Um, it's just now about how do we, how do we kick on from here? How do we, how do we go? How do we kick on from here and galvanize this, use this to galvanize the country even more because I've been seeing videos in Toronto when that final penalty went in and it's, it doesn't look like the country that I grew up in supporting the nat our own national team. If you know what I mean? So it's, it's amazing. Yeah, that side of things has been, it really has been different class. And I've never seen it either, the buzz about it. And with 2026 and this team doing what they're doing in Copa, it couldn't be better for the actual yeah. growing growth of the game. I mean, the broadcasters are sending a, a group of the, oh, they're, they're heading down to New York for this. I mean, this is unheard of. Yeah. Who's going down? TSN. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. No, I don't, well, so they bloody shit. Former Canadian players. Oh, I mean, Atiba. <laughs> 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 maybe one day we'll get there too david you, you know what I mean? maybe, maybe maybe we're not good looking oh. enough you know what's, you know what's great though i oh, listen to my broadcast and the u.s broadcast right it's been laughable and uh, they're, they're so upset now listen they're, they're also smart some of them know how to rankle people and get attention and alexi lao is a prime example of that but i just love the way they, they are just so pissed off that america the states are not in the semi-finals but canada pathetic poultry canada did it's not good enough it all adds to this great rivalry right and next year's the gold cup next summer right and presumably well i don't know let's hope they play their full strength teams but suddenly that's really really exciting the gold cup next year in that you have canada who, who you never know might be favorites where they're playing right now or certainly up there the states will probably be favorites mexico's in this low ebb at the moment but the ever? gold cup yeah big time right but the Gold Cup, which at times has been amazing, other times has been forgettable, next year suddenly takes some greater importance because it is this momentum continuing from Copa America. You've got the World Cup in 2026. And, and a good performance by Canada in that tournament next year? Wow, watch out. It sets the table, doesn't it, for what should be a thoroughly enjoyable and positive uh, World Cup, uh, Eddie. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. Like you say, the, the Gold Cup leading into it, um on the, off the back of this this summer uh hopefully we again we can kick on um 
maybe we should invite some some common ball t- teams into the Gold Cup. Considering I'm I'm assuming now Concacaf's <laughs> it's proven it's a harder it's a harder region, right? Now, uh, <laughs> proven, now, yeah, exactly. Now, now we're taking yeah. the piss in uh, in Copa America, so. Although the states and these you know, letting us down, aren't they? Really, yeah, letting the region true. down that's at this true. point. It does. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they, isn't the Gold Cup, Gold Cup, Copa America combination? It works. It works. We're going to get Vita Montelliani back on the show soon, um, right, Craig? And we've got to put it in. You have to combine these two tournaments moving forward, don't you, Dubs? I think so. Yeah, it makes it really interesting, and it and it ratches up the. Conca Caffrey versus the common ballery or whatever you're going to use as a noun or a verb for them. But it's just like, yeah. it's dark arts meets shithousery meets, I mean, the, with, who's it again? It was Uruguay, Brazil. Like, holy oh, shit. Jesus Christ. Right? Like, yeah. It's on un- like the number the number of fouls and like you the the trackers will say you know negative football you're not really playing and and I think that game was that but I th- I think it also makes it interesting it gives it its own certain flavor when you combine these two respective regions but I mean to hear to hear the U S and you're talking about those pundits and I think it's great because it shows how much the U S care that they're out and Canada is in and they can't stand it. And I love that. I love that it made Canada's relevant now because of their performances on the men's side. And these U.S. pundits absolutely despise us for it. So long may that continue. I just love that. But like you just you look at these these tournaments um, and and what's possible when you when you combine these two regions. And I, and I think that's great because it, it makes it distinct. It makes it unique. And, uh, and if Canada can be involved in the U.S. and then both regions, um, it makes it just I think ratchets up the, the interest. I think worldwide, especially with the Euros going on at the same time, like concurrently, it, it, it gives it like its own unique flavor. I would agree to a certain point, but I think for the development of our region, we need to have our own regional championship, just like every other region in the world. And I don't think they'll change that. We've invited South American teams before. Brazil's played in the Gold Cup, I think, four times. Colombia's played in it. Peru's played in it. Korea's played in it. Qatar's played in it. And we're getting away from invitational teams in the Gold Cup because they want to leave more spots for CONCACAF for the growth of the game. And I think that that's where I think in the end where it will stand. I mean, a lot of people are like, this is the first time we qualified for Copa. Well, we qualified for it in 2000 when we won the, the, the gold cup, but we were pulled out by the government because of safety reasons and Honduras ended up finishing third in our, in our spot. Um, but it's not our tournament. And that's why we haven't qualified for it. <laughs> it's just, it's their tournament. We've, we had this qualifying because they're in the States and I think they're trying to capitalize on, on Messi. And, and that's, it has absolutely worked for them because let's face it. If Canada's a, uh, about uh, responsible for filling the stadiums, it's not happening. But can't we make it some kind of qualification process then for Copa, like the gold cup, say the, the four semifinalists at the gold cup qualify for Copa, something along those lines. Not to diminish, diminish Gold Cup, I understand that. And I understand why you're adamant you must keep it, having won it, and you don't want it to be just disappear into the ether. Oh, and that's, not, that's not why. That's not why. I just think that, you know, when you look at the smaller countries, okay about the Canada's, Mexico's, America's, Costa Rica, and these types of teams, uh, but what about all the smaller ones that are developing themselves, that need help, need opportunities? You can do both, though, right? I mm-hmm. just want to see this again. That's all. I'm just—it's purely selfish. I'll well, yeah. really admit it. I want to see Fantastic. more Canada, Argentina's. Right? Let's let's be honest here. And now we're we're a force in the region, so let's let's jump in it and enjoy it. 